So, uh, in talking with our guest <coughs> earlier this afternoon when she arrived, uh, we decided that we would orient this as an interactive uh, event rather than the uh, more conventional lecture, uh, especially since... For the Twitter attention span. Yes, right. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to actually serve as moderator. Uh, those of you who know me well know that I'm never at a loss for questions to ask. Uh, and so I'll sort of uh, kick off with a couple of uh, questions uh, that we have sort of planted already. Uh, but we also invite you, whether you have read the book or have not read the book, to please join in the conversation. The conversation is about the meanings of food, cultural similarities and cultural differences in food, the historical significance of food, the politics of food. We can talk about Crimean food versus Ukrainian versus Russian food. There is actually a whole menu of topics that we can discuss. And so, um, to kick it off, uh, Anya, if I may, what, um, what should Americans care about Russian food? What particular uh, dishes do you think are distinctive or special? Are there particular attitudes towards food that are distinctly Russian that are important or interesting for Americans to know about? We know from St. Patrick's Day recently, corned beef and cabbage, the meanings of known as meatballs. What about Russian food? What is distinctive about it? Are there particular dishes that you think we should know about? Uh, well, first of all, just a quick thank you to both of you and to everyone in Villanova for coming, for having me, and thank you, Snow, for being not so severe, because it was an absolute surreal moment when I woke up and read the weather forecast, because last time we canceled, it was just the worst blizzard. Um, and I thought, Snow, again, <laughs> from the day that I have to go to Villanova, <laughs> and it's not possible. So thank you, the elements, um, and thank you for the amazing welcome committee. Um, and uh, to talk about food, the title of my memoir is actually uh, um, uh, Mastering the Art of Soviet Cooking. And um, the title meant to be slightly oxymoronic. And uh, it takes off Julia Child's famous book, uh, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. But whereas that is a totally earnest effort, um, the whole idea of Soviet cuisine in the eyes of so many Westerners, you know, is a joke. Uh, and also the whole idea of mastering is a very Soviet idea. We were like masters of space, masters of the universe, masters of this, you know, we invented, you know, the electric bulb, the airplane, the whatever, um, at least as we were taught in school. Um, but there is a distinction between Russian cuisine and Soviet cuisine, which I bring up, you know, very early in the book. Um, Russian cuisine was something was, uh, very codified uh, by the end of the 19th century, early century, early 20th century. Uh, it relied on very rich ingredients. It relied on bourgeois consumption. It relied on feast, on religious fasting. Uh, so that entire world order collapsed overnight in 1917 after the revolution. And the idea of this indulgent, kind of almost pornographic, Russian cuisine to which we say goodbye in the book, because the book is structured uh, across the Soviet century. The 10 chapters, you know, starts in 1910, 1920, 1930. And it is replaced with Soviet cuisine. Uh, and Soviet cuisine uses some of the Russian elements. Some of the dishes remain, for instance, like baking. Um, what's wonderful about Russian and Soviet cuisine to me is the yeast. And you know, again, the book kind of opens with yeast pastry bubbling and rising on the counter. And something very archaic, something very Slavic, blini, obviously, which are not just crepes, but are done you know, with raised batter. <coughs> Piroshki, savory pastries, piragi, big savory pies. Uh, something that relied on, some, uh, on available ingredients that stayed. Um, a lot of the other elaborate, for instance, river fish, 
You know, Russian cuisine was incredibly rich in all kinds of river fish. If you read Chekhov or Goncharov, you know, Russian classics, uh, and because of all the feast, uh, fast days, there was a lot of fish that completely disappeared. Um, it's almost atavistic by now. Uh, like when you read it, you know, and, and the, the first chapter in the book is essentially is about me and my mother saying goodbye to our notion of Russian cuisine uh, before we move into the Soviet century and trying to recreate dishes that we read about in Chekhov and Gogol and Goncharov and realizing that we have no idea how they are supposed to taste. <laughs> um, so I mean, it's a long, it's a long answer to your question. So what replaced it? Um, was a Soviet food canon, and we can talk about it later, that, that really kind of shaped <coughs> in 1930s uh, under Stalin's industrialization. Uh, and it was about creating an industrialized cuisine of convenience that also relied on the flavors of uh, Soviet republics. And you know, I think we should talk about it later, uh, in, and incorporating some, some Russian elements. So the dishes that we know. Uh, it's, it's a hodgepodge, for instance. Well, blini, as I say, is something very archaic, very Slavic, you know, very authentic. Chicken Kiev, it's not a Ukrainian dish. It's something that was invented in the late 19th century, and it had another name, but because of some kind of geopolitical thing, it got named Kiev. Nothing to do with anything, you know, it's like fried. Uh, Beef stroganoff, again, something semi-invented uh, that took its shape under Soviet uh, in Soviet Union, you know, very tough, grisly beef, you know, simmered forever in sour cream until, you know, it's, it's edible. And uh, I started kind of recreating, you know, the stroganoff that, that, that we make with uh, seared steak. And it's a completely different, different flavor, you know, but it's a pseudo-aristocratic dish. Uh, what else? Some, the, the among the things that survived, pickling. And this was something that was absolutely essential to preserve vitamins. Like if you didn't pickle what you grew on the dacha or what your cousin grew on the dacha or what you could get during the short growing season, you were essentially vitamin deprived because there was no, there was nothing out of season. So that is something very dear to us. Um, it's, but it's, it is a kind of an eclectic uh, cuisine which took shape in the 20th century, like American cuisine. What is America, what is 19th century, what is American cuisine? When you think about it, there's no, you know, there's no, it's, it's a compilation, it's a composite sort of idea. Um, there are a couple of seats up here in the front, gentlemen, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll hit the pause button here, so uh, we don't want anybody to have to uh, stand. Um, your comment about the importance of pickled foods, pickled vegetables, pickled cabbage in particular, uh, all kinds of pickles, how important a pickle is when you have your 100 grams of vodka, uh, leads me to my next question uh, before inviting members of the audience to speak, which is what do you see when we, when we study Russian history of the 20th century from from the period of the Civil War uh, intermittently, certainly during World War II, and then again in the 1990s when rationing was introduced into the major cities. Uh, food is involved with scarcity in modern Russian history and in Soviet history. And how do you think episodes of scarcity have influenced Russians attitudes towards food and their uh, food tastes? I think food really became, I mean, the, one of the reasons I, I, I wrote this book, because food was really kind of the object of national desire, conscious, subconscious. Uh, it really became this very focal, uh, it expressed status like nothing else, because people didn't really have cars, uh, people didn't have great apartments, even, even underground millionaires, like we lived in a communal apartment where 18 families shared one kitchen. And right next to us was an underground millionaire uh, who really couldn't flaunt his wealth because that would attract the financial police, the OBHS, and he'd get 13 years. So he lived in an absolutely squalid kitchen, but they cooked 
uh, you know, in fact, I described in a book how my mom stole, they would leave trays of this, you know, really luxurious foods like for us, chicken tenders, boneless chicken, my God. It was like hard enough to get a scrawny, uh, bony chicken, but, you know, these people had boneless chicken, and I would just leave a tray out in the kitchen, and my mom would just, you know, come back ravenous. And once she stole, and then she would, she came the next day, I followed her, she knocked on their door to apologize. And the mother, the millionaire's mother, said, what, that shit? Uh, we dump it anyway. Help yourself anytime. Um, so, you know, the food, food was a, uh, a marker of inequality in a supposedly classless society. Uh, food was the object of desire. Food was uh, the expression of hospitality. That was almost kind of obligatory uh, in the society. Uh, and all that because uh, there wasn't a normal market relation in play. You couldn't just buy whatever you needed. Um, and scarcity sometimes, you know, I mean, there were all these political rumors that scarcity was um, uh, sort of kept up, that the deficit was actually a tool of social control. I mean, I think it sounds like a conspiracy theory. In fact, uh, even if the government really wanted to, and at, at points that it did, you know, create uh, a model of centralized economy that would provide for everyone the consumer behavior. And it's actually a very trendy subject right now um, among Russian post-Soviet scholars, you know, like Soviet consumer behave behavior. I mean, hoarding was so endemic that you could actually plan, you know, according to your best mathematical model to produce something that you think would be enough if you were like a centralized government, not even taking uh, into account all the rotting that took place, all the mismanagement, all the stealing, you know, on, uh, of the food. Even if you did the perfect thing, you still could not produce enough um, because you never know what, what would spark a frenzy of buying. Weirdly, you know, talking about a completely different economy, in Tokyo, where food is extremely, extremely fashionable, certain foods are. For instance, there are certain French bakeries where they would make, you know, 20 cakes. Because, you know, the economic times were hard in Japan, and, you know, it's hard for them to, say, afford a Hermes bag. So they would, you know, buy a French Pierre Hermé pastry, and Pierre Hermé being, you know. Uh, so they deliberately ration, or at the Pachica, the ground, uh, the basement floor department stores, they deliberately ration the most trendy objects. So they're huge lines, huge stovid style lines of people just, you know, screaming to get something, and they, you know, they just get really, really upset uh, when, the, uh, they get there and, and then something ends in front of them now. So it's an odd, it's an odd echo. Uh, but you know, scarcity completely changed, to answer your question briefly, it completely changed the relationship to food and that the society had. And I think the hoarding is, is still a response to that memory of scarcity. If you see that 20 pounds, 20 kilos of sugar is available, you're going to buy 40 because who knows? <coughs> it just might not be there. And especially tomorrow. canned goods, you know, and, and there's so much stuff. Again, the economists, I mean, it's very hard to do any kind of economic study of, uh, of Soviet consumer society because everything, all the data was unofficial. Um, and there was so much black market. Uh, you would know, but uh, the hoarding was such people would number their, um, their cans, like condensed milk they would date them, like 1968. And apparently, you know, people had like condensed milk from 20 years ago. I mean, my grandparents did. And condensed milk, you need it because you'll go to the dacha or to shonka, you know, tinned beef, which was, in fact, first introduced as a land lease supply during the war. So you would mark your tushonka, and supposedly it got better with age. But a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, got sick. I mean, you can get really, you know, really, really sick from an old can. Uh, but that was, yeah, that was, that was this kind of just crazy consumer behavior. On the other hand, weirdly, there'd be stuff that no one wanted to buy. So it would be seen perfectly good stuff, like some kind of chocolate candy, that would just be unfashionable or too expensive. And so what the state would do, they would bundle. Because it was actually, you know, Soviet economics, someone has to feel for the store manager. Uh, because it was his obligation, it was always a guy, um, to, you know, to fulfill the quota. Uh, so they would send him half the stuff that was like super desirable. He didn't even have to put it out on the counter. It would get all bought. And half the stuff that was just nobody wanted. Uh, you know, some horrible types of farina, 
seaweed salad, blah, blah. <laughs> so what they would do, they would put in a, the most desirable commodity being uh, instant coffee. Uh, so what would he do, you know, and at the end of the, at the, end of the, of the cycle, of the plant cycle, he had to sell off the goods because otherwise they would get fined. You, you know, you, you couldn't sell it back. It was yours and you had to sell it. So you would bundle the, the coffee, one, one jar of coffee or good vodka, with like, you know, seven products that nobody wanted and you put it all in a package. And this is how you'd sell it, the bundling. Or, you know, even to get a subscription uh, to a very desirable magazine, monthly literary magazine, like Novo Mir or something. It would come with a subscription to, you know, a horrible policemen's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, uh, and some horrible candy and, you know, fish oil and, like, all this crap that nobody wanted. Questions, uh, comments from the audience? Alex. Um, I, I actually have read your book. Thanks. First of all, thank you for um, coming here and giving me a talk. I, I read the book a couple of months ago, so you're going to have to forgive me because I forget you kind of find your details. Speak a little louder, too, so oh, we. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Um, but, but I basically said I read the book and I'm kind of forgetting the finer details of it, but there's a section where you discuss moving with your mother to the United States when you're still a young girl, and I, I guess you moved to Northeast Philadelphia. And the, the, transi the transition that you had um, in terms of uh, transitioning from the, the Soviet food to the American food and, and having kind of some ambivalence and some difficulties. And I, I guess my curiosity is kind of what I was getting out of the book is that food plays such an important role just in the everyday life of people, especially in terms of the black market. There's, there's so much time is spent on food and then coming to the United States and it's one of like it's an afterthought and I was just kind of wondering if you could elaborate on that transition a bit more. Yeah, I mean, we, we did, we had a history with Philadelphia. Thank you for the question. Um, that's when we immigrated. This, uh, this was like my first American home. But not the posh, wonderful Bryn Mawr and, and Main Line, which we regarded as like, you know, as palaces. Um, we moved to Northeast, to like this really shabby house, which I just revisited a, a month ago uh, with the Philadelphia Inquirer. They were doing a piece on me coming back. And I looked at the house and I thought, how, I mean, I really felt sorry for ourselves. Because uh, usually childhood memories, you know, traumas are sort of exaggerated. And when you look at something now, it's like, fine. What was the big deal? This was the opposite. I said, like, oh my god. It was like this horrible brick, you know. They look like prison, prison cells. Like tiny windows, just really square, you know, this really geometric two-story, you know, red brick. Nobody here is from the Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, now, now it's a nice neighborhood, but you know, I mean, that that particular apartment block was just so depressing. Um, and so, it's not just food that was, you know, the object of you know absolute feverish desire. It was the whole the idea of West, of Zagranica, the abroad, and Western food. And I was actually in Moscow, a black marketeer, an eleven-year-old black marketeer. I would stalk children of foreigners. And we lived in a, in a mm, neighborhood with a lot of embassies. I would talk to the children of foreigners. I would befriend them. They would give me gum, uh, Coke, uh, you know, Smarties, you know, all, all sorts of. Uh, and uh, I, I had like just a ton of social prestige. And then in the girls' bathroom in school, I would like sell off the juicy <laughs> for gum. You, I'd have, I would have a ruler. And you know, you divide it up, you know, and each like, you know, millimeter would be like two copecks or five copecks. And even you were allowed to chew five times. And even the chew gum you could sell. So, <laughs> but you know, everyone was counting like one, two, three, four, five. <coughs> <coughs> and if God forbid, you know, you didn't spit the gum out, or if you swallow, I mean, and the people got so nervous they swallowed the gum, <laughs> that was like you could like, lynch for that. And then the teacher would find me, and you know, all hell would break loose because I was a black marketeer, and you know, they would say, "Oh, you get syphilis from chewing the gum." <laughs> <laughs> the syphilis was a big deal. Um, so imagine, you know, just having this absolute obsession, uh, unhealthy obsession with foreign foods and then coming and, and, and the scarcity and then coming to northeast Philadelphia where there were no sidewalks. We had to walk on an expressway to a path mark. And entering this path mark, which is as, as huge as Red Square, there's completely crammed with everything edible. So what happens to you, and uh, actually I should read, there's, there's a funny, Funny passage. Um, I mean, some people fainted. 
Um, some people just rejected it. I know, let's see. One sec. That's actually funny. Um, it was it was really just a gen. Uh, okay. Uh, my first supermarket experience was the anchoring narrative of the great Soviet epic of immigration to America. Some escapees from our socialist shortage society actually swooned to the floor, usually in the aisle with toilet paper, <laughs> which was a huge <laughs> shortage commodity. Yeah. Yeah. Certain men knelt and wept at the sight of 42 varieties of salami, while their wives, smelling the strawberries and discovering they lacked any fragrance, Right for opposite reasons. So the, the first complaint was American food doesn't smell. Oh, like a strawberry doesn't smell like a strawberry, an apple is like plastic. Uh, other immigrants, possessed of the Earth Soviet hoarding instinct, frantically loaded up their shopping carts. Still others <coughs> ran out empty handed, choked and paralyzed by the multiplicity of choices. The Jewish Family Services, uh, as philanthropic organization, offices where we collected our meager refugee stipend resounded with food stories. The stories constituted an archive of socialist misadventures with imperialist abundance. Monia and Raya, our neighbors, complained about the flavor of American butter after smearing floor wax on bread. <laughs> the Goldbergs loved the delicious lunch meat cans with cute pictures of kitties not suspecting the kitties were the intended consumers. <laughs> Vovchik, the Odessa Lothario, slept with his first American shiksa and stormed out indignant when she offered him triscuits. Desiccated cardboard squares? <laughs> Why not a steaming ball of borscht? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, food, just as it was in Russia, food was like the first thing that, uh, you know, people commented and complained about. Um, I mean, we had no idea what to do with all this stuff. Like my mom, I remember like, one of the horrible things. My mom would buy pop tarts, uh, but she didn't know how. T she didn't know she had to toast them. So we ate this like frozen. <laughs> <laughs> or she would get, you know, she would, she would, she was really curious about everything, <coughs> and she would get like Hormel's pickled feet, and put it like as part of the Russian dish. And I would like gag all the time. There was some horrible fried fish that came in this packaging. Oh, it was gross. Um, but everything tasted different because Russian food tends to be kind of sour and very savory and tough, sometimes too tough and sometimes sour from being spoiled. American food, like the bread is really sort of, you know, everything is hard. Everything was like uh, semi, you know, the beef was tough, the chicken was tough, the, you know, the bread was very sturdy. Here, like you got, I remember it was Thanksgiving when we came and at our Farrell school, they gave, a piece of Wonder Bread, right? like slice of like this processed tasting <coughs> white turkey, and on top of that would pour this white gravy. So can you imagine like I would look at this thing as like mushy Wonder Bread made like soggy with gravy? Like who would eat this thing? <laughs> I remember just being shocked at, at uh, Oreo cookies, like a black cookie <laughs> with something white and synthetic. I still can't like how can you make a black cookie? <laughs> 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 what goes for people? Oh like you know this black cookies you know this orange Velveeta. It was shocking. My mom loved everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the, sun, the, the uh, split banana split. We would go to this neighborhood diner, the Robin Hood, and they would bring this. It was like this. <laughs> um, I did like cheesesteaks, though. Yes, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you used in uh, one sentence uh, words hospitality and obligation teaching and religious studies as I do obligation is not a good word um, but I, so lest anyone goes away with the wrong impression obligation comes out of their the goldness goldenness of their heart the, the largeness of their soul their hospitality is just reflexive uh, and is this not true where did I use the word obligation Earlier, when, uh, you next, were just when you're talking about, oh, you said, of course, hospitality is an obligation. When we were talking, you were talking about distinctive features of Russian <coughs> Oh, hospitality, I mean, it's a cultural obligation. It's not as well, I mean, like, I have a house in Istanbul, and I think the Islamic societies, especially that way, I mean, like, you can't, someone, or, you know, even now in the Middle East, in Uzbekistan, and Central Asia, you know, you walk past, there's an obligation to invite you. 
and give you a share with you, whatever. And then you walk out. I mean, they talk about Georgians, and then they will tell you walk out, you know, then they'll kill you. <laughs> I mean, literally, there have been stories. Uh, I mean, it's a cultural code, I would say. Not necessarily an obligation, but a, a cultural code in Russia. Uh, well, an edifying one, I think. No? Yes, yes. But, you know, I mean, you can't go, you, yes, for the most part. Uh, how can it not be? But you also have the, a culture of a, a state and a state where guests sometimes would travel for, you know, six to eight hours. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's really a matter of surviving, survive, survival to take in somebody, you know, with that level of cold and harshness of climate and feed them. Um, yeah, but it, it is a cultural code. I mean, I mean you, 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 you probably would well, work yes. working about charity and arms yes. and... Um, Certainly, the uh, obligation is not, I agree with you, not exactly I think the cultural, right co word. cultural code cultural is more... It's cultural code of generosity mm. without limits and without complaint. Uh, you would... Uh, I remember certainly going to uh, dinner at Soviet Friends and having the table be so covered with food that you couldn't see the tablecloth and you knew mm -hmm. that your hostess had spent three days yeah. standing in lines, going from store to store, but she would never say, I stood in line for eight hours and worked for three days because it, the idea was to make it effortless and for it to be a genuine gesture of generosity, even though everybody knew the labor that went. Also, that people went say with you, especially if you live in Moscow and, and in the desirable cities, uh, I mean, my grandparents' house, you know, before we, we didn't have telephones, people would just show up with bags, relatives, and, you know, you never ask how long they were going to stay or whatever, you know. They were, and if you had other relatives already staying, everyone would sleep on a cot, you know, you had this, like, tarp, fold-out cots. Um, I mean, this is how people lived, you know, it was, I mean, here you didn't have the need to do this. And their food became very important because, you know, if, if, if you wanted to impress someone in the West, mm, it wasn't necessarily through food all the time. In Russia, there was really no, almost no other way uh, that you can impress a guest or, you know, uh, show your, you know, a whole range of emotions. <coughs> food was, like, really the only thing almost that was available. <coughs> Stan. Yeah, I, I happened to have spent some time looking at Soviet food conservation uh, systems, what we would call the food preservation mm -hmm. system in this country. Um, and um, the one thing I could never really get a handle on was, yes, they had a food preservation industry. You could buy canned goods for the most part. Um, but to what extent did they find their way into the actual household? My experience in, in Soviet homes, not, not typical because of the people I was meeting, I didn't see uh, canned goods being used. They seemed to have struggled through the local market to get what they did. No, no, canned goods were hugely, hugely, hugely important. I mean, first of all, I mean, and the, the interesting thing about the Soviet food preservation, uh, I mean, Soviet food culture as opposed to Russian food culture, really has kind of a beginning date and, 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 a, and a, a person who brought it into being and that person was Anastas Mikoyan who was Stalin's uh, commissar of the food industry. Believe it or not, Stalin had a commissar of the food industry. And in the spirit of Stalin's kind of maniacal industrialization that touched all aspects of society and being also a very smart manager, this Mikoyan, this Armenian guy who you know, later rose through the ranks uh, and was known for his, as a, as a political survivor, you know, he outlived Stalin and Khrushchev and retired under Brezhnev. Uh, he went to America uh, in 1936. Stalin actually, I mean, I described it in a book, you know, Stalin, he, he, he was going to Crimea with his wife and four sons. He stopped by to say goodbye to Stalin, who was his old friend. Uh, and Stalin said, why don't you go instead to America? And Mikhail said, well, I promised my wife a holiday. He said, no, it's okay, take your wife with you. Uh, we really need to study uh, advanced industrial food production. And they sent Mikoyan and a delegation for six weeks. Uh, they went across country. They came here on SS Normandy, which he loved as well. And they studied everything. They studied canning, especially corrugated cardboard. 
juice production, uh, Chicago slaughterhouses, California fruit canning. Um, so a lot of what Soviets perceived was like, like so Soviet ice cream that we were very proud of, American technology. Uh, Russian burgers, katlete, Mikhail was inspired by the American burger. Um, so a lot of the mad juices, like Mikhail was absolutely smitten with uh, orange juice. But of course, you know, Russia didn't have enough oranges. So they made tomato juice the national drink. Um, but he was, he was just absolutely uh, uh, incredibly impressed with what he saw. And America was at, at the pioneering forefront of food technology and mass production and in those years, <coughs> in the 30s. Uh, and they, they borrowed uh, a huge amount. But in terms of cans, now cans were huge. Fish, for instance, uh, canned fish, and sprout, the sprouts, mm -hmm. Syrah, uh, all this canned fish, yeah. uh, herring. Well, herring was more like fish. <coughs> oh, in the huge jars, um, kilka, of course, uh, canned meat. During the war, you know, the land lease supply of Tushonka, which was uh, produced in Iowa during, uh, according to Soviet Russian specification, it was a Russian recipe, and then they continued making it in Russia. Uh, condensed milk. Actually, a lot of these cans and with, with, with their labels, um, very iconic, they were all done under Mikayan in the 30s. And they, they survived, well, well into today, they're being revived actually. So um, you probably, you know, I mean, people would, in, and they were very prestigious. You had the holiday zakaz, the take home package, you know, for special nomenclature uh, organizations, always cans, always like Saira. Oh, cod liver, it was disgusting, but it was super <laughs> prestigious. Well, you may be interested anecdotally, they had a problem with their canned goods because they, they did not use the blind cans. They used steel cans. Mm. And uh, the result of which was the cans always looked black. When you took the food out, this didn't go too well with a lot of people. No, I know, they were gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but people, you know, people said, not all of them. The no some, some cans were lined. And, yeah, the cheap ones weren't. And <laughs> then the, the preservation, but uh, the compotes, uh, canned, you know, like jars. As well, no, but this, the, the, the iconic Soviet cookbook uh, called The Book of Healthy and Tasty Food, actually Tasty and Healthy Food, um, that's like, you know, a totalitarian kitchen Bible. They combined, you know, Soviet propaganda about how everyone starved in the West um, with, you know, great recipes and great advice. But it was full, it was like a glorification of the Soviet canning industry. I mean, they made huge advances considering uh, it was a backwards agrarian society where everything was done the artisanal method. There was like no standardization. They they have made you know a tremendous leap in in, in just a few years. Yes. Good evening. Hi. I was wondering if you talk a little about a little bit about Russian potato salad. I know it's a little different than uh, potato salad that's usually made in the U.S. Um, I was wondering, uh, were you a little taken back when you saw I guess, the differences when you first came here? Well, the Russian potato salad, oh. it's called Salat Olivier, mm -hmm. and it's a potato salad with pickles, boiled carrots, some kind of protein, you know, either kielbasa or chicken, and lots of mayonnaise, which is another canned icon, the Provencal brand mayonnaise, which is really tangy and nice. I have a whole chapter about it. Um, again, when I encountered the American potato salad, still, it was really sweet. Because everything Russian, the, the salad is kind of tart and tangy. Uh, uh, yeah, the deli, the deli style potato salad, coleslaw, still horrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sweet. It's like dessert. Uh, and American food has gotten less sweet. You know, it's 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 kind of as meeting uh, European. You talk in the book about the Russian potato salad and the importance of the protein ingredient. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? For those who haven't read the book yet, do you want to talk about the different uh, cultural connotations or economic connotations? Well, it's very interesting because you know food can, food could exp uh, express class, uh, cultural belonging, um, but especially by the 70s towards you know mature socialism, <laughs> the Soviet Union was a very kind of semiotized, very coded society. You could walk into someone's apartment and just like by glancing 
at the book spines, you could tell, well, they got this book through this way, they have a subscription to blah, blah. The, you know, you could tell like so much about a person just from like very few signs, and, and it was the same for the food. And so, you know, it was a very basic potato salad, but everyone made it differently. For instance, to have kalbasa, kalbasa doctor's kalbasa, which is kind of bologna, it was like such a proletarian thing. My mom still was say, oh, how could I put kalbasa <laughs> in the salad? Uh, like this kind of militant dissidents uh, who really, <coughs> condemned uh, the commodification uh, and the worship uh, of uh, shortage of ingredients, they would not put any protein. They would like make a very populist, very impoverished kind of salad olivia. If you had tongue, you had access to party stores. Uh, my mom makes her you know, very sort of bohemian with crab meat and apple, which is unusual. So like you know, two ingredients of, and you kind of knew who the person was, like you knew the kind of person that would never put something in, in, in their Salad Olivia or that would, you know, it was, it was very curious. And it's still, it's still alive. Like we still argue about Salad Olivia, that, that the potato salad. Way in the back. Uh, I have a question. I know mainly your book's trying to cook with Can you speak to the Salad Olivia recipe? Um, well, I mean, the weekend meal was a big, I mean, peop people would have breakfast together before everyone dispersed for work very much like here, but, you know, it was like a heavier breakfast. Um, and then my father, for instance, came home from lunch because he didn't work far. Uh, so we actually had lunch with father, but it's, there's not like a tradition, it's, it's more fluid, uh, like when the Russians get together now, in, in, you know, here, they will get together at like four o'clock on a weekend. And it's like this bet between lunch and dinner was uh, when you called when you called guests. You know, often it would be like four or five, not so late. I mean, the late supper uh, it wasn't like the Mediterranean thing, and the long lunch neither. I, I don't I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. What would be like a standard? Um, I mean, workers have their break. You know, I guess between twelve and one or whatever, and you had a horrible school lunch. Uh, I mean, the whole institutional kind of meal was something very reviled and very frightening. Uh, but, you know, at home, the family would, would get together probably like at a weird time by, by Western standards. Back in the 70s, I knew well a very old fashioned intelligentsia family. There were three children and the parents, and at six o'clock every evening, they would sit down and have tea. Mm. And tea would be. Uh, there would usually be a soup, there'd be tea, there'd be cookies and candy, uh, but the, m the main ingredient was tea. And that was, and that was it for the day. They had a big lunch in the middle of the day that the whole family joined in for, and then they had this big tea at six or seven o'clock, and, and that was their family tradition. Yeah, it's curious. It was, it was kind of more, more, more diverse, you know. Whereas in like Central Asia, when they said tea, it's like at 11 o'clock and it's vodka, <laughs> and tea, and pilaf. Because um, you know, there's so much, so much time was spent standing in lines, like when you had your, your uh, work lunch, women especially <coughs> would uh, run out and stand in line for something. Um, so usually you would just take a sandwich or something to work. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't a big meal thing, but you know, weekend meals, weekend family meals. Yeah, it would be like four, five, six. <coughs> Lynn? Oh, Lynn. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you a, a question about kind of the process of preparing foods, and it relates to the issue of lines. You know, you start out the book talking about the the grand imperial Russian feast that you're making with your mother, and it's this sense of community, right, that you're, you're bonding over the struggle of, ma of preparing um, this food that was from a lost world in a way. And then you talk about the fact that there's 18 families sharing a communal kitchen. And so I wonder, in the United States, a lot of times the preparation of food in the home is this ritual for the family. It's with, with traditions and um, 
uh, and community. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the differences or similarities between that idea of community within your your kitchen with your, your mom in the States and the community with either tensions or um, uh, rapprochement in uh, the communal kitchen. Well, the communal kitchen was really uh a microcosm of the Soviet society, and you know, for, for those of you not familiar with the institution, right after the revolution, you know, Lenin signed a decree, you know, to partition uh, bigger dwellings um, and bring people together. Uh, so let's say if you had a one-family apartment, five rooms, you would move in five families there. And it was very statistically, it was very inhuman. It was like eight or nine square meters. Uh, per statistical unit, not even per person, yeah. <laughs> which is which is a weird thing. And those communal apartments brought people from all walks of life together. You know, you would have like the old aristocratic old lady who, let's say, owned the apartment. You know, she'd get like one corner. Then you'd bring in, you know, anti-Semitic people, Jewish people, you know, Tatar, you know, janitor, uh, some high-ranking. I mean, in our apartment, it was incredible who we had. Uh, Always an alcoholic, always an old lazy, always an, alcoholic. always an old lazy. Would call from the former, you know, the former aristocrats, you know. And so there'll be these humongous fights. Uh, there'll be like knife brawls in our apartment. There'll be people, you know, the alcohol. We had the two resident alcoholics. They'll be like sprawled out all the time. The aristocratic old lady, she was caught stealing people's soup meat because I mean she was a poor pensioner. So the entire apartment decided to lynch her. I mean, she was like, you know, uh, because what happened is you had this com comrades cor courts, people's court, you know, so like the elders of the apartment got together. I mean, you know, usual offenses would be like to turn off, not, not to turn off the kitchen light uh, or to leave something, you know, to leave the water running. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, there was soup theft, uh, there were brawls, um, there was uh, this, this, there was a Jewish old lady and this rampant, you know, big anti-Semitic thugs, you know, who would just call her. You know, my mom was called a kaiket. Because she, my, my father brought her into the apartment, and they call her, hey, Sergei, where's your kaiket? You know, where's... <laughs> she was like, fine, this, this is how, you know, this. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's an institution that sort of began to end when Khrushchev, in the late, starting in the late 50s, instituted this mass uh, housing drive of prefab apartment blocks, but they finally brought, you know, gave a nuclear family the promise of privacy. And you know, it was one of the biggest changes in the Soviet society. And like one of Khrushchev's, more than the Sputnik problem, more than you know, one of Khrushchev's uh, most important achievements. It doesn't get talked enough today, but the shift from the communal kitchen to the private kitchen, uh, all sorts of interesting things happened from that. But on the other hand, it was an institution that is missed now, now that it's gone. Because people suddenly remember that, yes, you could borrow a cup of sugar from someone. So many recipes, like half of my father's recipes that he knows are from communal, because he, he grew up in that apartment uh, with 18 kitchens. Uh, the old ladies who babysit us, um, you know, the birthday cakes, when, you know, whenever, I mean, in a good situation, whenever, you know, you cook something, you gave something to your neighbors. You know, neighbors became your forced extended family, so all the positive you know, came came with a negative. I mean, our apartment was just a nightmare. It was like something from a loony bin. But other people, other people had very close relationships. And yes, they cooked together. And yes, you know, when someone had an egg and someone had something else, you know, there would there would always be the sharing. Jeff, yeah. um, I think your point uh, is well taken about the fact that shortages change the relationship between the individual and the food. Oh, any commodity, yeah? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and in particular, I don't mind um, making people more resourceful. And if I could tell one, just one small story to exemplify uh, speak that. Speak up, please. Can you hear him in the back? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Speak louder, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to exemplify it with a short story. <laughs> I was uh, teaching at Moscow University back in 1987 when it was still the Soviet Union. It was in the winter. And my wife and I and our son, who was seven, had just arrived. And we didn't know quite what to eat. There was a gastronome next to the Soviet-style Soviet apartment we were in. 
And so my wife and I said, well, let's go shopping. Maybe we can get something to eat. And we went to this supermarket. And of course, there was nothing, in the, nothing to buy. And we looked around for something to eat uh, without any success, really. And finally, in a freezer section, we saw a frozen chicken. And we said, well, what are we going to do? There's nothing else. We'll try the frozen chicken. So we brought the frozen chicken home and put it in the oven. And after a few hours, it sort of smelled like a chicken. <laughs> and, and it uh, looked like a chicken, but it bounced like a basketball. <laughs> it was the toughest piece of meat I've ever seen in my life. You couldn't cut this chicken with a serrated knife. You didn't roast Soviet chickens, Russian chickens anyway. Yeah, well, you boiled exactly. them. Exactly. What we learned when we mentioned this to our Russian friends was, oh, you never eat that. What you do is you boil it It's down a hen. It's not a chicken. Duck. Yeah, it's a hen. And, and, and that's useful. Um, but you don't eat it. So it's <coughs> that kind of resourcefulness that's promoted by deficit. And, and one additional question. You haven't mentioned the, uh, the, the kolkoznik ribak that people would often get real chickens at, good food at. And often, the t I've been, as Adele mentioned, to these wonderful dinners with tables are covered with food. I'm not sure they were really out all eight hours in line. They would go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the No, 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 but the kilo market. of meat at the, uh, the farmer's market costs a monthly, a monthly <laughs> salary, not for more, more. A monthly salary. Well, to get a virisca, to get like, you know, a, a piece of beef or whatever, 190 the rubles. I guess had access and they could get stuff for Zakazu. Yeah, I was in Moscow in 87, and the exchange rate, exchange, unofficial exchange rate was like 1 to 25 to 1 to 40. I mean, for $3, it was, it was something ridiculous. I mean, we, we could buy anything, but the people, the people who live there, I mean, the, 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 the markets were just extremely well, expensive. <coughs> I, it's true, though. The, the collective farm markets <coughs> have disappeared, what, the farmers' markets, and where there, <coughs> there are far fewer of them fewer of them than there used to be. No, they're very, very trendy now. We were talking <coughs> about it, you know, now like uh, Moscow really follows all the latest trends in London or Tokyo or wherever. And so the whole locavore thing uh, is, 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 is very fashionable. <coughs> um, I was telling Adele there's a store in Moscow called Lavka Lavka. Um, and if you look at their catalog, um, so, oh, and this farmer was a nuclear physicist, and then he changed his lifestyle, and he moved to the thing, and now he's making this brie style, you know, goat cheese with a goat named Annie. I mean, like, this whole kind <laughs> of thing. Exactly what you find here, you know. Uh, and then you look at the prices, and you go, oh, what? Uh, they have, I, I looked, one P, one P pod, a dollar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for it's, 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 it's actually sort of fashionable. Uh, because nothing, nothing, otherwise nothing is domestic. I mean, the agriculture has been so ruined, starting with, you know, the collectivization in the late 20s, that you go to a supermarket in Moscow. I mean, Russia is a big country with a lot of agriculture. The onions are from Holland. Uh, the cucumbers are from Spain. The peaches is, you know, half the stuff is from Turkey. And yes, you can get something domestic, you know, something that looks green and bumpy and doesn't have pesticides, and you'll pay, you know, like $5 an apple. It's crazy. So yeah, the farmer's market exactly is what it is here. So you talked a lot about the, uh, the food and urban environments after, like during the Soviet period, but what was it like in the rural areas after collectivization and when food was centralized? Like what, what was living like then? Well, it was brutal. It was really one of the greatest tragedies of the, of the 20th century. Um, the Stalin's collectivization drive you know, starting in 1929, it ended in a famine, 1932, 1933. That took away, I mean, the, there's still revisionist estimates, you know, maybe up to 7 million people. Um, the grain was requisitioned from the peasants by force. Uh, anyone who was uh, accused of having any surplus, there were armed brigades. Uh, they were stripping the peasants. I mean, the memo, the memo, the recollections, I witnessed recollections from the time are just like horroring, you know. They were really stripping people naked, taking everything away. Uh, the peasants resisted, you know, they ate the livestock, they ate cats. Uh, I mean, they, they hid everything. I mean, they really kind of scorched earth. 
um, that again they played, you know, during World War Two, but on Stalin's orders that time. Uh, and there was just, it, it bred a tremendous, you know, my book is about the urban experience, you know, uh, so few urbanites really had serious interactions other than forced outings, you know, to, to, to help in collective farms. But the hostility between city and, uh, you know, city and countryside that started, well, that always existed and, and that revolution kind of stoked um, because the grain requisitioning started in 1917, you know, the, the forced removal of uh, grain from peasants. Um, the agriculture has been destroyed by this. It never really recovered, you know, and, and the result is today uh, that if oil prices drop, I mean, Russia is not producing anything, including agriculture. And I, I speak to so many chefs, I know so many people who have restaurants, and they say, you know, we cannot use domestic products because they're still uh, after them. You know, the, uh, you have to pay a bribe to the health authorities, to the packaging authorities, to, you know, to get any seal of anything, you know, just like level of bribes. Then suddenly they would raise the taxes. Then suddenly, I mean, they're really still, you know, screwing up. Uh, and, and like I know people who, you know, oligarchs who try to have this like idealistic uh, farmland and they were paying a lot to the farmers and they were really trying to do good and the farmers would just steal from them because it's an instinct. I mean, there's just such hostility. Mm. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I brought here um, my Russian literature class, and you talk a lot about uh, literature, actually, not just in this book, but also in your uh, um, Russian cool book. It's not very traditional, sort of, for a cool book to quote uh, Chekhov and, uh, and Gogol and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, my question is uh, whether you can dwell a little bit on uh, on on, uh, on literature. What what what? We find out about uh, food, uh, reading Russian writers, and other way around. What uh, <coughs> um, you know? Uh, what is the influence of uh, of uh, writers uh, uh, in your writing uh, about food? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a, there's a very 19th century Russian literature. Um, there's a very strong tradition of what I call the food porn. I mean, the, 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 the descriptions of food are really abundant uh, and extremely seductive. I think one of the Rus contemporary Russian writers, Tatiana Tolstaya, suggests that it's, uh, it's to make up for the, uh, it's a sublimation for the Russian literary taboos on writing about sex and eroticism. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the, a lot of the, especially in Chekhov, um, you know, there's this delirious, descriptions, you know, in Goncharov, in Oblomov, there's a section called Oblomov's Dream, where, you know, he remembers what happened to he in, in his estate, you know, and there's this whole kind of ode, and it's written in this kind of very, um, uh, Tolstoy, who was a vegetarian, and a moralizing vegetarian, devotes, you know, very luscious passages to food. Gogol, the entire dead souls, can be seen as, you know, one grifter's journey from dinner to dinner. <laughs> in the huge Russian countryside. The interesting thing is this. I mean, if you take, for instance, Balzac, uh, you know, the same, the same time as Gogol, you know, very, very descriptive, very naturalistic. I mean, that kind of naturalism, it is what it is. It's, you know, naturalism, just, you know, kind of this hyperrealism. In Russian literature, the interesting thing is that food descriptions, food writing always carries a moral dimension. What they do is, after giving you this, like, you know, incredible odes, you know, to the rosy hams and whatever, they expose the glutton as, like, a Philistine and a bad person. It's always the gluttonous person is always bad in the end. Uh, you know, and Gogol, uh, Pituch, uh, all, you know, all the uh, landowners um, who cooked a lot, not great people. Uh, in Chekhov also, it's satirical in the end. So you kind of, you, 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 I always feel that they pull you into this moral trap, like you're supposed yeah. to salivate and then you're supposed to feel guilty mm -hmm. uh, for salivating. It's a very Russian trait, you know, this moralizing and, and very interesting. And in the 20th century, you know, the food dwindles and the descriptions of it as well. I mean, the exceptions are, of course, Bulga Mikhail Bulgakov 
uh, that in, in dog's heart and you know parts of Master and Margarita, they are very beautiful descriptions of food. I think, uh, in, am I correct in remembering that about a third of the days of the year in the Orthodox yeah, a third calendar of the day. are fast, fast, fast days? Fast, 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 uh, yeah. And then you have long, long fasts. But even on on a what Wednesdays and Fridays are fast days. No yeah. meat, but very mm -hmm. luxurious. The but fast cuisine was even more luxury because they had this abundance of river fish, sturgeon, which is like meat, mushrooms, pickles. So in the end, you have this very decadent, very indulgent yeah, fast cuisine. Um, you don't know. They lived. So they it's lived. Not they like lived. Herring well. and a pickle. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. I mean, monasteries, you know, and then and, uh, uh, some of the, you know, great traditions were being preserved in, in monasteries. Uh, and then they would invite all the important people, the monks, during the fast, you know, and then they would say, there's this, oh, yeah, would you like, I mean, there would be like 50 kinds of fish. I mean, where that fish went is, is, is one of the great mysteries. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there's so many. I mean, a lot of the names, I mean, I just know the names. I have no idea what it tastes like. Completely fished out. Mm -hmm. well, uh, just building on your last comment about knowing the names and not knowing what particular fish tastes like. For just this room is filled with students. Um, what do you? What would you advise students of Russian literature, Russian culture to taste, either on a trip to Russia or in the Russian store here, or in some at home? What you know, top three is part of the experience. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, here, here, there's Bell's Market. I know. <laughs> um, top three is hard. I mean, the, I, I would taste the pickles. Mm -hmm. They have this great pickle section. Uh, and not just like Slavic pickles. Then they would have Georgian stuff, like pickled eggplant with walnuts. Um, I would say like piroshki. You know, anything like bake. Uh, yeah, piroshki with, with cabbage. To me, this is something so Russian. The piroshki fried, either fried, they have really good fried ones, either fried or baked with cabbage. Um, and what else? Some gingerbread, pryaniki. Mm -hmm. That's very traditional. Forgive me, the one food you didn't mention, which I fell in love with and would eat often, was soup. I think Russians make a wonderful soups soup. and a, in a wide variety, and uh, just relatively inexpensive and, and delicious. Yeah, my mom, my mom, yeah, Russians. It's true. I mean, zakuski, the appetizers and soup. I myself, I'm not a soup person for some reason. And uh, also, like as a child, you would, if you came home from lunch, the last thing you wanted is like A, to see your mother at lunch or your, you know, your family. <laughs> it's like, you know. I mean, I w because the kids who, 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 who were nearby, you know, sometimes they were home and, and then they would stuff you with the soup. And it was always like watery and I'd put a pickle on it and I was like, oh. But no, I mean, ob objectively, the soups are really good. <laughs> I wonder if you could say a few words about, um, I hate to keep returning to the theme of scarcity, but the art of survival especially. You have a wonderful uh, passage in your book about your family's experiences well before you were born, I might add, uh, during World War II. And uh, what, what was your family's uh, strategy for survival during the war? Well, I think the general strategy during the war, because, you know, Russia came uh, into the war with already very scarce grain reserves, because 1939 was not a good <coughs> year, uh, and a lot of the spending was spent on defense in the war with Finland, so uh, the supplies were already bad, and, and, and essentially the Nazi plan, you know, called the Hunger Plan, uh, was to starve, you know, the population of, of most of Ukraine. But when they came, they, they encountered scorched earth, you know. Because Stalin made a famous speech in July of 1941, you know, urging everyone to just burn the crops and burn everything. Um, at the same time, you know, the centralized model was slightly suspended, and people essentially were left to fend for themselves. Um, schools would have little, you know, vegetable plots, a work uh, professional organization I mean, people were moved out of cities you know into evacuation uh, they grew whatever they could uh, then more gruesome stuff you know I mean soldiers ate horses not just horses but saddles and straps you know anything out of leather in Leningrad which was under siege for 900 days uh, 
uh, you know, people that works with the, I mean, now, now they're talking, there's this very, you know, gruesome revisionist kind of, uh, you know, people are finally talking about cannibalism uh, mm -hmm. during World War II, because it was, it was kind of a taboo subject, and it still is, and there's a lot of controversy about it. Um, but, you know, it was obviously tragic for 900 days, there was no, nothing incoming, uh, you know, just a small road through the north, uh, bringing in some provisions, but, you know, a million people died, a Russian. I mean, I have in the book um, an image of the Russian card for 125 grams. What is it? Yes. Um, and the story of the lost Russian card. Yeah, and there's a story of my mom. I mean, my mom was seven, and she was sent to, because, you know, her, her mother had a baby. So mother stayed with the baby, father was at war. Uh, grandfather was digging potatoes somewhere in frozen land, and she was at age seven sent to the store uh, to, to buy things with Russian cards. And uh, it was the first of the month, and she had all the coupons. You see how the coupons are? And then they cut them. At the store, they cut out the square with the right, with the right wick or day in it. So she had coupons for, you know, these were for bread, like bread, milk, you know, the, uh, the sheets were like for different products. She had all of them in her pocket. Uh, and there was a huge line, and it was absolutely frozen. And she didn't sort them out because they had a blackout, an electrical blackout. So she put them on the counter, all the cards, all the, all the rushing sheets on the counter, <laughs> hoping to sort them out. And then suddenly their fingers, 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 like in one minute, uh, all the Russian cards are gone. And she realized, and the Russian cards are for the entire family. There were five of them. And she realizes at seven years of age, she realizes that she, she's, she's brought death to her entire family, because it's the first of the month, they have no Russian cards, how are they going to live? Um, and in the end, they, they sold, when they were evacuating, my grandfather was a spy, and the driver who came from the See, ministry, you have to read this book. <laughs> he went through the closet and he looked at his uh, suits hanging, and he told my grandmother, take it. And she said, no, why am I going to take it to evacuation, you know, the war will be over in two <coughs> minutes, you know. He said, take it. So my grandmother started w going to the black market and selling his suits or, you know, trading them, bartering them for, like, sacks of millet. Uh, and that's how they survived. If they, had, if they didn't have the suits, they would have died from starvation. We have time for one more question. Lynn. Can I, I just a, a personal question, not about food, but about your grandmothers. You have two grandmothers described in the book who are just tour de forces. I mean, they are, a, a, and I, I just wonder if you could just share a little bit of, about these two women who did cheat death so many times, um, and kind of the south they were for your family in many ways. Well, they came, they came from an era in the 1920s uh, where there was really this massive transformation of Soviet society and where like new kind of people were being forged and created, and they were both, you know, new Soviet women. Uh, my paternal grandmother, she lost her husband when she was uh, 19 in World War II. Uh, you know, she raised my father badly, I should say. Uh, but she was, you know, she was a career woman. Both, both of my grandmothers, very typically for that generation, were lousy cooks because they were brought up uh, in an era where, you know, housework was really disdained. And the idea of, of the government in the 1920s was to liberate women the woman from the household pot <coughs> and you know put her into the workforce um and you know they were both very strong uh they're very strong women you know in in a way i mean for all the uh horrific things about the soviet society it also gave you know a lot of benefits especially to women um and um my, my maternal grandmother she went to find her husband through frozen Leningrad during the siege when there's only one road available called the road of life and you know which was bombed you know th on sheer, sheer ice uh, you know she went to find him because she found uh, a, a photograph of another woman in a parcel that is <laughs> 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 you know uh, and my grandmother Allah you know she she was she drank vodka like a guy she played billiards you know she played cards she was six feet tall, gorgeous, you know, bleach blonde, uh, but both very emancipated. I mean, compared to like uh, grandmothers in other in other in other cultures, I mean, very very strong women, definitely. 
That's a wonderful note to end on. A tribute yes. to them, a tribute to you for such a wonderful <coughs> and rich hour and plus and a wonderful book. Thank you very much.